Okay, I think we will get started with the session so we can try to stay on time at this conference. And so welcome to the post-transcriptional gene regulation uh, session of the yeast meeting. Uh, I'm Audrey Gash, I will be your guide today. And our uh, first speaker is uh, Jennifer Andre from Josh Akey's lab at uh, the University of Washington who is going to talk about a cradle-to-grave analysis of cis-regulatory variation in yeast. Right, so thank you to the meeting organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk this morning. I am very excited to share with you my recent work conducting a cradle-to-grave analysis of cyst regulatory variation in yeast. Okay, so my slides are not advancing. Can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. Um, so cis regulatory variation is an important source of phenotypic diversity within populations and also a target for adaptive selection between species. And my favorite example of the latter is um, that cis regulatory variation underlies the differences in beak morphology in Darwin's finches that led to their speciation. Uh, an important example of within species uh, diversity that's due to cis regulatory variation is that there are a wide variety of diseases in humans um, that where the, there are differences in susceptibility between individuals that are due to cis regulatory variation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, Cis regulatory variation can cause the differences we observe in phenotype by affecting any of the molecular steps in the conversion of DNA sequence information into protein. And while I think we're getting a good understanding of how cis regulatory variation can impact these uh, molecular phenotypes individually, we still do not understand uh, how variation in one phenotype is related to variation in another phenotype. Uh, my goal, therefore, has been to use the awesome power of yeast genetics to, um, under, to look at eight different molecular phenotypes, which I've listed in the bottom corner there, and um, examine everything from the, how the circulatory variation is affecting chromatin structure, um, so that's sort of the cradle of my title, all the way through protein degradation, which is the grave of my title. Uh, next slide, please. So there are several ways to look at uh, cis regulatory variation. One particularly powerful method is allele specific, looking at for allele specific expression. And um, so in this framework, you begin with in yeast the two haploid strains um, that you're interested in, and you mate them to form a diploid. And then in the diploid, you um, compare expression levels of the two parental alleles. And what makes this framework so powerful is that in the diploid, all of the transacting factors and environmental differences that could affect expression of these two alleles are going to be the same. Um, however, one potential caveat of this approach is that it's dependent on the levels of variation. So you can only tell which allele um, an RNA molecule or that you've sequenced came from if there's a variant um, in that RNA. Next slide. So when I set out to do this project, I wanted to um, use two strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and do an um, intraspecies study. And so I'm showing you here a tree of the relatedness of um, the commonly used yeast strains. And uh, next slide, please. Um, I picked these two here, Y12 and DBVPG6044, which I'm just going to call DB for the rest of my talk because uh, they're very highly diverse. They've got about six single nucleotide variants per KB. And additionally, um, they're a nice choice because they have low admixture. Um, one problem with the choice of these strains is that they lack high quality reference genomes. And so um, all of the assays that I wanted to conduct for my cradle to grave analysis uh, are mostly sequencing based, and so I need to have high quality references to map back to so I can accurately call which allele and RNA um, molecule I sequence uh, belongs to. And so to remedy this, next slide please. Um, we performed 
uh, about 100x pack bio sequencing of each of these two strains uh, coupled with um, about 1,000 fold coverage um, with Illumina of the transcriptome. And next slide, please. Um, we assembled these two strains into chromosome length contigs. Uh, and you can see here that both strains are about 11.8 megabases. We think that um, this difference with the S28C reference strain in size is due almost entirely to the presence of the TY element in the reference strain at um, pretty high copy numbers as compared to these two uh, more wild derived strains. Um, and so the only chromosome that we didn't get uh, chromosome length context for was chromosome 12. We couldn't assemble across the RDNA region. Um, and I think the N50 and N96 statistics here um, reflect uh, how great these assemblies were. Uh, with the transcriptome data, I was able to annotate a little under 10,000 um, RNA uh, genes in these two strains, and about uh, 5,000 of those genes in contain predicted open reading frames. Uh, so next slide, please. So um, to actually conduct this cradle-to-grave analysis, I began again with my two haploid strains that I was interested in and mated them to form a diploid. I then grew this diploid up under standard laboratory conditions to mid-log phase in a large 500 mil culture. And then uh, with the help of some of my lab mates, um, simultaneously took aliquots for eight different, these eight different assays to measure the eight different phenotypes I was interested in um, and performed the assays. Um, currently, we're still working on collecting our mass spec data, but I do have um, all the sequencing data back from the sequencing-based assays. And this data is relatively new, so I've um, only had time to analyze three of these um, uh, phenotypes results so far. And so the three that I'm going to tell you about today are next slide, please. The nuclear run-on assay, which measures transcription rate, a uh, polysome pro profiling assay, which measured translation rate, and an RNA decay rate time course, which of course measured RNA decay rate. Next slide, please. So more specifically to measure um, uh, allele-specific differences in transcription, I performed a standard nuclear run-on assay, labeling the cells, uh, the or sorry, the newly transcribed RNA with biotinylated UTP, and then I'm able to select out those newly transcribed RNAs with streptavidin beans and sequence them. And next slide, please. Um, to determine whether there's uh, allelic differences in transcription rate, I calculate the proportion of the reads that come from DV um, over the total, so any read that I can assign to one allele or the other. And then I just ask whether, uh, next slide, please. I just ask whether this ratio is 0.5 or not. Um, and actually, for all three of these assays, uh, we've been working really hard on developing uh, novel statistical methods, or we're using some methods that we've already developed in the lab to um, determine if there's statistical significance. And I uh, won't tell you about those today, but I'd be happy to tell you um, if you want to come find me uh, after my talk. So next slide, please. So to measure allele-specific decay, um, we treated the cells with this drug 110-phenanthrolene, which inhibits transcription, and then took samples of the cells uh, right after drug addition, and then 15, 20, and 30 minutes after drug addition, um, and just asked what the ratio of the two alleles was. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, you can see at zero minutes, the um, proportion of alleles from DB is a little under 0.6, and by 30 minutes, this has decreased to almost 0.4. So um, this is an example of a gene in my data set where the DB allele is decaying faster than the Y12 allele. Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, I was looking for allelic differences in translation. And for this assay, we treat the cells with cyclohexamide, which suspends the ribosomes on the RNA. And then um, we perform polysome fractionation to separate those RNA molecules out by the number of ribosomes that are bound. And we can sequence the RNA that are in the different fractions corresponding to the different number of bound ribosomes. 
And in a conceptually similar way to how we look at our need to carry it, we can just ask if there are differences in the um, ratio of dB uh, alleles to total um, over the, the range of our um, gradient. Okay, next slide, please. So um, in analyzing the data uh, across the genome for all the genes that I had high enough coverage of, um, we find extensive evidence of allelic differences in these three phenotypes. So 1 minus pi 0 is um, the inferred number of genes that show significant differences in the phenotype. So about two-thirds of the genes show differences in transcription and translation rate, and about one-third show allelic differences in RNA decay rate. Uh, next slide, please. And then at a false discovery rate cutoff of 5%, I can identify exactly which of those genes that um, I assayed show those allelic differences. Um, so for instance, for transcription, we were able to look at a little over 1,000 genes, and about 650 of those show, I can identify as having allelic differences in transcription. So. Um, I, as I told you at the beginning of this talk, um, the results I just showed you are interesting. It's um, interesting to look at these phenotypes individually, but what I'm really excited about with this data set is understanding the intersection of how cis-regulatory variation is affecting these different phenotypes. Um, and so just simply looking at the overlap between the genes that um, show significant differences in each of these three phenotypes for all the genes I was able to assay for all three phenotypes. Um, you can see that like over half of the genes show uh, allelic differences in at least two of the phenotypes, and 106, which is about 10 percent of the genes, um, show allelic differences in, in all three phenotypes. So I think this is um, really exciting, and I'm looking forward to um, sort of understanding how these different uh, phenotypes or the cis-regulatory variation underlying them is um, interacting. Next slide, please. And I've begun to drill down a little deeper by just looking at the correlation between the different assays for the genes that are significant for, for um, those phenotypes. So um, in red there, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer up here, but um, in red, on the first two plots on the y-axis is the proportion of dB um, from the transcription rate assay, and then in blue on the left plot and the x-axis of the left plot and the y-axis of the right plot is the difference in RNA decay rate that I pulled out of that RNA decay rate assay, and then finally the, the center and right plot on the x-axis is a measure of um, the number of ribosomes bound to the DB transcripts. And um, so this measure uh, controls for um, already that if there is a difference in just levels of a particular allele, I've controlled for that. But um, so you can see from these plots that nothing really jumps out in the left and right plots. Um, and so it doesn't seem like decay has a clear relationship with transcription or translation, but um, next slide, please. In the, when you compare transcription and translation, there's um, a modest but very significant correlation between transcription and translation. So this seems to suggest reinforcement. So the allele that is transcribed more is in turn being translated more. Um, next slide, please. So um, in summary, I told you a little bit about this cradle to grave analysis of um, cis regulatory variation in yeast that I'm working on. Um, and in all, we will be looking at eight different phenotypes. Um, and to lay the groundwork for this project, I de novo sequenced the two yeast strains that I'm working on um, and achieved uh, chromosome length contigs and was, were able to annotate um, most of the genes in the genome. Uh, there seems to be extensive evidence of allelic variation in the individual phenotypes that I looked at, and um, we think that there's widespread pleiotropy. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'd just like to thank some of the people that helped me with this project. So um, first of all, uh, of course, my lab and my mentor, Josh Akey, my thesis committee, who's given me a lot of great advice, um, John Wakefield that helps us with all the statistics, the Eichler Lab, 
um, who did some of the PEC biosequencing for us, and then the Macas lab is, is going to be helping us with the mass spectrometry. Thanks. So like uh, making an F2, um, we don't have any plans to do that, but um, I, th I think. What was the question? Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, um, will we be able to do crosses to um, further dissect, I guess, the, the genetic variation that's causing the things that we see? Um, and I don't act currently have any plans to do that, but I think that would be a really interesting um, uh, Thing to do in the future. Do you have a sense of, a, of effect size? That is to say, say you take the top 500 genes, is the effect size much stronger on transcription than, say, translation or decay? Um, so, I don't, I don't know um, how to compare, I guess, the effect sizes of these different assays. Um, I think, so these data are very new. I think eventually maybe I'll have a better idea of like, for example, um, you know, how much pro more protein is produced if we see a particular difference in uh, translation rate. The, um, the decay rate differences, uh, like a difference of, I think, 0.6 would correlate to like twice as much RNA of the allele that's decaying more slowly um, after an hour. But it's all kind of relative. You, the co calculation is complicated. Okay, I think we'll move on okay. now to keep on schedule. Thank you very much, Jennifer.